Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to sit around your word, to discuss your word, to get more insights into the spiritual and how it affects the physical and how we are part of that. Also in relation to your prophetic timeline, where we are in relation to that. Father, I thank you that you revealed to us these insights and to help us to prepare for your bride. I thank you. In the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. All right. So this week, Chukat, regulation. Anyone want to say something about your own studies on Chukat? Any highlights, things you want to share before we jump in? The same, the, 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 the wood and the scarlet yarn and the piece of is the same as the, um, what's the one? The cleansing of the leper. The cleansing of the leper. Yes. The bird. <clears throat> yeah. Is it the bird that they take? Yeah, the one bird they kill and blood they drip in water. Yeah. And they've got the scarlet and the, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Same symbolism. Mm -hmm. That connects the two. There's another thing it connects to. Have anybody thought about that? If we look back on our Torah portions, there's something that looks like a red cow, but it's not one. That's connected to this one. That also has to do with water and purification. A, a sacrifice? It's not really a sacrifice. It was more a symbol. Now, from a five, you blur your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> the golden calf. Oh, yeah. So they ground the gold, mm. put it in water, and people had to drink yeah. it. Mm. So if you connect the two, you can make the assumption that that was for yeah. their purification mm. and that the red heifer is the solution to what happened back mm. then. Mm. So there's a connection, just connecting a few of the patterns, a few of the dots that will give us insights that just make you think. If I think if you dig a bit deeper, you'll find mm. a bit stronger connections and a few mm. uh, revelations regarding that. Mm. One thing that I, um, just one little highlight was the thing I if somebody's died in a tent, and you, if, if you're in, and you go in the tent, and if things are uncovered, um, that they are unclean. And it made me think of being a picture of if you are around death and uncovered, a vessel that's uncovered, then you, that death affects you too. You know, like a, and there's another thing where the two sons went into a tent and they covered the nakedness mm. it can also be uncleanness mm. which was noah mm. and ham received a curse because he didn't treat it the right way mm. and that curse connects to leprosy it connects to uncleanness mm. the same pattern applies there as well mm. nakedness of course is the flesh the sinfulness and if you expose nakedness it brings shame because sin brings shame it's shameful to be exposed if you're sinful you see the same connection and same patterns in there as well. That's why I always said, don't be unequally yoked with the wool. Because you take on the air. Yeah. 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 And you're moving in the same direction as they are. Mm -hmm. and because it's all about the way yeah. that we are on our way to a destination. If you're yoked with someone in the world, they just want to go in a circle. They want to build their whole thing around this life having this best life now and they will only circle around if they're not traveling towards something greater that's why the the yoke you will always turn to one side because they will be grounded and you'll just walk around them trying to get ahead is that also the, the reason that you know you, you heard the statement veneration of the dead where people celebrate certain um, ritual, what's that after wake? You know, that yeah, the wake, yeah. Junk. 
and then they go and then they fiddle with the body, then they take the body and they put the body somewhere else, they dig the bones up and they put the body mm. somewhere else. Yahweh yeah, never intended that whatsoever. Mm. He was supposed to bury that body that day. Yeah. Go on, don't dig it up. Mm. That's where the uncleanliness came. And it's the same today. Don't dig up the pot. Mm. Once mm. you buried it and Yahweh is covered it, don't dig it up again. Mm. And But the church do today, they do grave sucking. Mm -hmm. So either go and lie on the graves to get the anointing. Mm. Yeah. Or they actually dig up the bones. So one of our most favorite prophets in the world dug up um, Captain Kuhlman's bones to get her anointed. I think he dug it up. No, I think he dug it up. I know they also go to the home and sit in the bathtub and... Oh, yeah. What? The same thing. It's all sort of Getting silly things. They, they miss yeah. where the origin of the anointing comes from. <laughs> yeah. It's not from man and definitely not from, from their dead bones. Mm. So there's a whole of a lot of confusion around that. Mm. So if we read the Torah, it's very clear that we you know it's, it's mm. bad if you do that. Mm. So don't be sucked into grave sucking. <laughs> it's a simple thing struck me is if you look at the program of sacrifices, it focuses on males, mm. rams, bulls, whatever else. Mm. But the red, it's the red heifer. Mm. It's like quite a it's female. female. Mm. Very distinct, very separate from. Mm. There are some times when it says take a female goat. Is it? The sin sacrifice is female, is it? Mm. The daily sacrifice. Mm. But the Passover is a lamb, mm. uh, a, a, a male, a ram. Mm. So there's male and female. Eh? What do you think is the connection there? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. You know what it says that Yahweh took, if you read it, it says Adam, uh, Yahweh took the side of Adam and he created her. Mm. But how does that relate to the Messiah? Because the, the red heifer depicts his sacrifice, but he's male. But this now is female. So, so there's a bit of a connection mm -hmm. there that we need to explore. We, we, we're not going to explore that, unfortunately. <laughs> but in the previous Torah, of course, I did two years back, I've got a little section there about the male function or the male role of Messiah. Quickly, I can't remember it, so I'm trying to sort of think about it and the female function so it has to do with um, where the woman has one egg the male's got many sperm and it's like having a lot of ideas and the woman will take the one idea nurture it and it will come to fruition where the male's got a lot of ideas so in the same way the sacrifice of the heifer, the female part of the sacrifice, is to take that one special idea and bring that into fruition. And, the, and leading to the female, of course, it leads to birth. So this is actually connected to that one idea the father had, which came into fulfillment through the symbolism of the red heifer that is connected to bringing new life into the world because the female is the one who's the life giver. So that's the female function of the work of Messiah, mm -hmm. is to produce life and to take that work of Mashiach, that one work, which is the ultimate sacrifice, which is also depicted by the Red Heifer, where he becomes unclean, when we become clean, mm -hmm. and that's also linked to that. So as, as the work of specifically around his first coming. Now what the Red Heifer connects to, it connects to the first coming and the second coming. It's got symbolism for both. So the sacrifice of Mashiach and all that, we're going to look at that in, in a moment, um, is directly connected to the red heifer and the ashes, the waters of separation and cleansing. And it's also a symbol of the second coming. You can make a connection to the second coming with the red heifer. Think about today and the Jews and they're searching for the red heifer. What's the purpose of that? So that they can be 
so they can uh, so they can clean the temple. the temple. That's it. Yeah. So they they want the ashes to cleanse their priesthood mm -hmm. because that's a requirement. They need to be sprinkled before they can mm -hmm. do the service as priests. <clears throat> And they actually want to start the daily sacrifice. But before they can do that, they need to cleanse the area mm -hmm. before they can build an altar, before they can start the daily sacrifice. So when you read mm -hmm. Daniel and also Matthew 24, it talks about the sacrificials will be stopped. So that means it will start. Before it can start, they need to red heifer. So the red heifer or the, uh, the Jews finding a red heifer is the first sign mm -hmm. that it's very close. Mm -hmm. Now, I've, I've uh, watched... Um, a research that I saw where are they currently at with their red heifer. So they are breeding red heifers in Israel and they did an update on YouTube. I've got the link there mm. in March. So they've got two red heifers, mm. but they've got some white um, yeah, yeah. hair in there that might turn red. <clears throat> so they having these two potential red heifers mm. that one might be kosher enough. Mm. And once they have that, then they will potentially use that because it's only once in a blue moon that you get a red heifer. There hasn't been a red heifer in 2,000 years mm -hmm. since the destruction of the Second Temple. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. How long would the it's, ashes keep? Like, you know, the, um, the burn to ashes, and then when the ashes are finished, they need another... Yeah, they put it in water, and the water they preserve for the cleansing. Right, so I wonder how long that would last. You know, how... It's until the water is finished. <laughs> A, and, uh, and they only sprinkle it. So. The heifer is big. No, you so you can shower, you can make a big, and, yeah, a large volume of mm -hmm. cleansing water mm -hmm. from it that can last you. But didn't also the utensils and everything had to be clean yeah. before they could even be anything in the temple, and that was changed by. But it's changed by the red heifer. I think it's uh, this water of purification yeah, that's that used for all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we're going to look at that yeah. and how many red heifers they were and when they were and all that, just for interesting sake. And then basically there were nine red heifers up to the second temple. Mm -hmm. Hasn't been another one since, 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. So they're waiting for the 10th red heifer. Mm -hmm. So The other thing that's interesting the red heifer, which... is that, you know, there's all the big issue of Al-Aqsa Mosque and the and the conflict over the Temple Mount and whatever, then you assume that this has been going on for centuries. But in reality, Alexa was never a it was never a pil pilgrim site for Muslims mm. until the establishment of the State of Israel. So the whole this whole sort of um, it, it's a creation to stop them from getting onto the Temple Mount. And it's only happened in in the last generation. Mm. Yeah. So it's another indicator. indicator marker of where we are at in prophetic in the prophetic timeline. Yeah. And we've looked at the enemy or the guardian of the threshold. Mm. Seeing that force is fueling mm. what we see in this last generation to mm. stop Israel from actually performing. But they need to perform so that the marriage can be fulfilled, mm. which is the last step. You need the temple, you need the sacrifice and all that to happen mm. to signal in the, mm. the, the time of the end. All right, so good summary. Kicking off, let's go. All right, so we're just going to look at Numbers 19, I think, verse 1 and 2. And so there's a lot of things in there that when I read through it this morning, oh, yeah, I would have liked to do that and that and that. But mindful of we're going to sit here a whole day and um, it will be too much information. So we're just going to focus on the red heifer <laughs> for today. We're going to also continue the storyline from last week. Not because I wanted to. It's just because something jumped up in the, the meaning of the word chukat. And then it just continued again. So very interesting. So we're going to look at the roadmap, prophetic roadmap. Through the Great Tribulation, the wine press of the thousand years, and the starting of the eighth cycle, and what's going to happen there, and there's some more information that's going to happen and give us some insight of what's happening. And we're going to pull that into Ezekiel 8, Revelation 22, Revelation 20, and Zechariah 14, just to tie those things together, because there's a lot of speculation. I also watched 
a video on someone who wrote a book who wrote about the Battle of Gog and Magog. And they believe that battle is imminent, it's going to happen now, before the coming of Messiah. And then I just read the verse that he was preaching on, and I said, no, that doesn't fit, mate. <laughs> so I'm just doing a, a bit on that, just to clarify it in context of what we already discovered, just to make it clear that even Ezekiel 8 is still fitting the bill. And people not having the understanding of the cycles mm. will not see this and they will just bend it into their doctrine mm. and their ideas. Mm. So we try to get scripture to interpret scripture, not doctrines to interpret scripture. Mm. So this is just a quick one where we're at. Um, we're number 19 of the counting of the Oma, which will be up to eventually day 41 if we finish this month. And then in July, that's actually where Shavuot will be. Now, I'm going to show you a slide that I'm working on in the background, working on something else. But I just put it in here for interest sake, which relates to this one. Now, this is the fee cycle. And this just shows us where we are currently in our current counting the Omer. We are on our way to the Omer 103, which is the 28th of the fourth month of uh, which signals Shavuot or the receiving of the tablets or the commandments. So the next slide I want to show you, which is quite fascinating. I've made the same one on the same pattern, counting the Omer from creation and all the main events. So this is where I'm landing. And what's interesting where Shavuot is, is where Yeshua is born. It was born was born yeah. and look at this when Yeshua started his ministry in 26 AD it's 4328 the 28th of the fourth millennium and to number 43 the Gematra support his ministry and what he's going to do so it's quite fascinating to see that his work is found within the fourth millennium similar to the fourth month which is the pinnacle of the festivals which Shavuot is all about mm -hmm. every single branch of all the festivals, pull back and point back to Shavuot, which is the main thing. And if you read Zechariah, uh, there's Isaiah 2, that talks about the people will go out to the mountain of to Jerusalem, and he will teach them the Torah from the mountain. That's Shavuot topic. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. It's about the commandments, teaching him his commandments, mm -hmm. and he's teaching the nations. And we're going to look at who the nations are, where they're coming from, and why they go up. In relation to all those passages already mentioned so this is just something interesting so we're currently here between the sixth and the seventh millennium which is interesting which is um we're going to move on we're going to go to the seventh month which is the seventh feast which is trumpets it sort of give us the same time frame if you count it from creation now the, the number four three zero three or zero four is basically when they counted from AD 1 or AD 0 and calculate back to creation. So I've studied numerous charts, charts and this one basically fits the bill um, more perfectly uh, of all information that's there. So I just want to continue. So I'm only up to Abraham. I still need to do Sodom and Gomorrah, find out when that's happening to get their number. So the intent of this is I'm going to take those numbers, get a gematria of that to see what's happening within each one of them to get some more information. And that's basically also to finish the cycle. So as you can see, when we pass the seventh millennium, which is the wine press, we're going to the eighth day. And so we're going to be a nine and a 10 and 11 and 12. So this whole cycle that's going to finish with number seven, when number eight starts, I always thought it's going to follow the weekly cycle, but it's actually going to follow the feast cycle again. So it'll also be a time of darkness, just like we had the time of light. And after the eighth millennium, which is the new beginning, there's going to be a dark time again. And we're going to touch on that today to see what set the stage for the dark time that's going to happen in the new cycle, which is fascinating in itself. But a background there, um, very fascinating to, to compare the two things in relation to each other. Just to lay some foundation for today's teaching, um, this one was Gog and Magog. This dealt with one of the enemies, the 11th son of Canaan, which is basically to do with the Lord of the Gap and 
cutting pieces, dividing to go down, and the house of Elohim rests in quietness. So it's basically going through that time of separation and then entering into the house, um, which is Bethel. Number 31 um, is also featuring on this chart, as you can see, 4331. And that has to do with nothing, no possess to burn mighty one godlike. So that was King Josiah who destroyed all the idols and all of those things. And he was a beloved of Yahweh and he basically cleansed the whole place. His name or his life was connected to number eight. He was eight years old when he was chosen. Eight years later, he started to re reset up the, the tab tabernacle uh, and, and repairing the house of Yahweh, the age of 16, which was the same age. And then later on, the 18th, he's um, instigating the festivals, which is Passover. Now, why Passover is important? Because the Jews um, you read the parasha of, or, or read this parasha before, or the, the uh, Numbers 11, 19 actually, before they enter into the Passover season for cleansing and purification for the new cycle that's going to start with Passover. And I think that also coincides with the, the fact that they will definitely start their daily sacrifices with the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. I think that will be their very first sacrifice after they cleanse it with the ashes of the heifer. Mm -hmm. They will do the sacrifice of the Passover lamb and then they'll have their daily sacrifices. And then that will be stopped and abomination of this lady set up and then we count three and a half years from there on. Very interesting to see the connections with King Josiah as well as with what's happening with the Jews and the connection back to the red heifer and the cleansing of all the idol worship and all the abominable things which is connected to leprosy or the sin of fleshiness which we looked at last week with Korah and the regeneration of the Nachash within the flesh. Um, false prophets, just quickly jumping back on that Korah, the matter of Korah's to a five, that is each and scab, which are the scab heads, perverted ones with a strong opinion. And they're also connected to a mountain. So that means that they've got an elevated platform that they address people from, similar to Yahweh addressing people from Mount Sinai. We also see his name connected to ice, which is very important for today's study because we're going to see another connection back to Korah, and also the crystal which linked to the presence of Yahweh when Yahweh called his prophet. Which prophet was it again? Ezekiel. So the question I asked last week was what encounter did the prophets of today have to anoint them as prophets? Did they have a similar experience as Ezekiel? Or was it just self-proclaimed prophecy? Or did they go to a uh, internet anointing or do they get go to a little school somewhere um, that someone taught them to be a prophet so it's something that's really taken serious and I think the prophets of today that are preaching repentance and turning back to Yahweh they are the true prophets mm -hmm. the ones who's telling you you're going to have a car you're going to be married you're going to be rich they are false prophets mm -hmm. because they support prosperity teaching which elevates mm -hmm. the flesh mm -hmm. not elevates cleansing and holiness and preparation of the bride. So just a quick jumping back into that. So we're going to start off with this one, which is the ninth sun. And we're going to continue our storyline from here because we're going to um, link back from the word Chukat back into this topic. And that's the ninth sun, which are the Arvadites. Arvadi, that means I shall break loose. And the one that was restless and was grieved and under pressure and that basically linked us to the seventh millennium or the wine press where the serpent or the nachash will be released which we read about in revelation 20 he said and i saw an angel coming down out of heaven having a key from the bottom of his pit and a great chain in his hand and he seized the dragon the ancient serpent who is the devil and satan and bound him for a thousand years and he cast him into the bottomless pit to shut him up and set a seal on him that he should not deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were ended. Question, where did the nations come from? 
If everyone was destroyed in the battle during the Great Tribulation, then this verse is not true. So there's nations who came out of the, the war. I'm using that phrase specifically because we're going to see that in another prophecy in Ezekiel 8 that referred to this event. And then he said, after that, he must set free for a little while. When the thousand years has ended, Satan will be set free from his prison. And he will go out and deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. So when will the battle be? After the thousand years, not today. <laughs> Even though there's some things you can connect, Revelation 20 gives us a clear indication of the time frame of Gog and Magog. And it also mentions the number will be like the sand of the sea. Now we're going to make the connection to a prophecy that's given to Abraham, the promise. And the promise is also what gives weight to judgment. We're going to look at that in a moment. And then he says, uh, they, travel, they traveled the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from Elohim out of heaven and devoured them. And that is the plague that we read about. In Zechariah 14, that says, I will gather nations against Jerusalem for battle. The city will be captured and the houses plundered and women ravished. Women ravished. Half of the city uh, will go in exile and the remainder of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then Yahweh will go out and fight those nations as he fights in the day of war. And this will be the plague which Yahweh will strike all the peoples who go and do battle against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot as they stand on their feet, and their eyes will rot in the sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouths. Mm -hmm. Now, rotting is actually a decay, and rotting can also happen with extreme heat. Mm -hmm. It will decay or burn away. It's, well, rotting is actually like eating, like consuming. Mm -hmm. You have a consuming fire, or if you rot, you, you get consumed by mm -hmm. the worms and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then he talks about, then it will be all the nations who have come against Jerusalem and survived. This is interesting language that's used here. Mm. So it's not the people inside the city who survived. There are people that came against as well and against the city who attacked them that survived. Mm. And they will go out to Jerusalem to worship the king mm. and celebrate the Feast of Sukkot. And if they don't do that, there will be a curse that come upon them and there will be no rain. So we get the, the remnant of the first battle, Armageddon. They who survive will enter the thousand years and they will not be deceived by the devil. At the end, the devil will deceive the nations who are existing during the thousand years who survived the first battle. Now we see the second battle and they survivors of the second battle of Gog and Magog. And they will be outside the city. And that's what we talked about last week in Revelation 22, which I think is coming after this. So this is the, the verse that the preacher used to say that its battle is happening now. But listen to the language. He said, Yahweh spoke this, his word to me. He said, son of man, turn to Gog from the land of Magog. Uh, he is the chief prince of the nations of Mishe and Tubal prophesy against him. So we can see he's the prince, the chief of Gog. And he's the one who's leading the army of Gog and Magog. And he said, I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws. This is Yahweh speaking to Gog or the leader. I will lead you out, of, out with all your military forces, with horses and riders. Your soldiers will be fully armed. And I will carry a large and small shields and able uh, uh, shields and be able to use swords. Persia, Sudan, and Put will be with you. They too will have shields and helmets. And Goma will come with you with all its troops and with the nations of Targoma from far north. There will be many armies with you. Be prepared. Be prepared. You and all the soldiers assembled around you. You will be their leader. After a long time, you will be called to service. 
So there's a phrase, after a long time, you will be called for service. How long? A thousand years um, went by. And then he said, well, I missed my point here. After a long time, we'll call for service. In the years to come, you will attack a land that has been rebuilt after a war. It is Amgenon. Its people have been gathered from many nations and brought to the mountains of Israel. And last week we saw the mountain of Ephraim. It's the mountainous area where the city and the temple is. And that's basically where they're going to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, the third temple. And then he said to the mountains of Israel, the mountains that have been desolate for a long time, which is a thousand years. These people were brought there from the nations, and all of them lived there safely. So they rebuilt the city, they all lived there safely, and they probably got taught Yahweh's Torah during that time. As the bride will rule over nations during that time, that's basically what's happening. You will attack like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. Your troops and the many armies will be with you. You will attack my people, Israel, like a cloud covers the land in the days to come. I will let you attack my land so that nations will, cut, will know me, and I will use you for my holy purpose as they watch. So this is basically Yahweh grabbing them like a fish hook in their mouth, pulling them out of their whatever they were doing, and say, come here, you're now going to attack my people. You're going to be part of my play. And my display will be my power to show my people my glory. And because you are evil, you're going to play that, that role coming from your evil background and your evil nature. And they are also the ones who are deceived by Satan that we read in Revelation 20. That's why they are the villains who are going to attack so Yahweh's people. Gog is not a place. So Gog is a person. A it's a leader, a prince. And Magog is a place. And the war of Gog and Magog is the leader who assembled the people from Magog and also all the nations from the four corners of the earth to come up. So it was a massive battle of all humans against Yahweh. And if you think how, how, how many people can multiply in a thousand years without the influence of Satan, without you know, bringing bad things against humans. They will be basically multiply like, like grasshoppers and be like a plague. And he said they will be like a cloud to come over the land. If you, have you seen a, a locust plague? Mm -hmm. It looks like a cloud mm -hmm. who appear and it becomes dark as they fly over. And that's basically the symbolism that's used here that will happen. So this is definitely in line with the language that are used in um, Revelation 20 as well as in um, Zechariah 14. Um, Ezekiel 8 verse 21 to 23 says, I will declare war against Gok on all my mountains, declares Adonai Yahweh. Each person will use his sword against his re uh, relif, what? relative. Relative. I will punish Gog with plagues or, and death. I will send rainstorms, large hailstones, fire and burning sulfur on his troops and on the many armies with him. So that's the plague that will eat them. That's the fire that will come down um, to, to destroy the enemy. And I will show my greatness and my holiness. I will reveal myself to many nations. Then they will know that I am Yahweh. So that is basically the battle that will take place. But we see that there are survivors. So yet Yahweh's grace is um, yet again displayed within judgment. So there's people who come to faith during the Great Tribulation, which is Armageddon. There's people who come to faith during the thousand years. And they're similar around the mountains area where Jerusalem is. And they live in peace. And then even the last war, which is Gog and Magog, these people who survive and come to faith yet again. Yeah. So we see three chances of grace after the time that we're living in now. So yeah. some people preach and say, 
and you have to accept and sign now because this is your last chance. You will burn in hell if you mm. don't accept him. But we see that even people who are stubborn, if they repent during the time of him appearing mm. and they see his glory, they can come to faith. Just like mm. the uh, guy on the cross next to Yeshua, mm. and they will be in paradise with him. Mm. So he's extending grace more and more and more mm. over the people during the time of judgment. So judgment equals grace. It's not a time we are always angry to destroy. Mm. It's a time of grace that people can be born again. Mm. All right. So those who come out of the battle of Gog and Magog, this is the connection to Chukat. Now, Chukat is the name of the Torah portion. It's the opening phrase from Numbers 19, where Moses say, those to cut ha Torah, meaning this is the, the decree of the Torah. Now, chukat means decree, it comes from the root word chuka, that means to entrench, carved work, appointment, custom, manner, and statute. Now, when I saw that, I thought about creation an artist creating something, specifically carving something out. Now, when you look at the log of wood, the artist will see potential. A common man will see a log of wood. But the artist will carve away the things that is not part of his creation. And it will be the debris or what's left over or what do you call it? The, the rubbish that's left behind that need to be sweeped up and throw, throw out. But what Yahweh is doing here is carving his creation and he's creating a people. Mm -hmm. And from whatever is removed, he then used that then to try and recreate or mm. to bring that back to life. Like a jeweler. Yet again. Mm. And whatever is then removed, he will use that again and try to recreate that again. And then after that, he will try and do that again. So three times we see that he's using the carvings and the things that's been removed from that that is beautiful to try and make that beautiful as well. Mm. So he is someone who does not stop mm. trying to use every bit of waste mm. to recreate that into something beautiful. When I was a kid, there was a, a jeweler at the mall that my mom used to go to, and I remember watching him one day making a gold ring, and he was dremeling away the gold shavings, but he had it in an area where all everything that came off of that one piece fell back into it, and he'd sweep it up into a little pile. And then into a little container, and he'd remelt that into a chunk. And he melt that. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the war. The heat. time of judgment, yeah. the fire, mm -hmm. melting it together. Then he carve again, mm -hmm. reshaping it. What's left, he melt again. Nothing will go to waste. Mm -hmm. Yahweh want to save every single person, mm -hmm. every single life form. That's mm -hmm. grace. And I think that cycle will continue. Because we're going to look a bit on beyond the eighth millennium or the starting of the eighth millennium and what will happen um, beyond that, just to see that there's a new cycle coming. So what I found the connection back to the, the our enemies, specifically Gog and Magog, is the Gematria of Chuka, which is the name of the Torah portion, means multitude of Gog. That's the first meaning that was in, in the dictionary. So what does it mean? The remnant of Gog, the remnant that come out of the Great Tribulation. This is the remnant that come out of Gog. Trodden down, to be grieved, emptiness. So that's the state that they're in because they just experienced this massive, you know, um, spectacular event that they were on the wrong side eventually or initially. And then shelter, refuge, something prescribed, ordinance, ruler and governor. Now, when I read something prescribed, I, I thought about if you're sick, you go to the doctor and they prescribe medicine. So what is prescribed here is an ordinance, which is the word chukah. So the medicine for your leprosite or the medicine for your stubbornness and the medicine for your rebellion is chukat. That's a solution to our problem. And that's what the Sora portion is all about to put the focus back into his Torah, specifically the ordinances. And the ordinance or the chukat are basically the ones that you can't explain. Mm. 
You just have to obey it because Yahweh said so. It's not logical. You don't understand it. Those things will heal you if you obey them. But once that's logic, you will do it because it makes sense to you. So it's not driven from Yahweh. It's driven from you. Oh, that's a good idea. I'll do that. But if he says, do this, why? Because it will bring healing. Okay, I'll do it because you say so, not because I think so. That's the difference between a chukat and a normal commandment. That makes sense. And then we see ruler and governor. Of course, that's Yahweh's rulers that then will help these people. Divide, split, half. That's a separation that will happen again. Backslide, turn back, fornication, prostitution, and then Yahweh comforts and forgiveness. So yet again, we see the remnant of Gog that's trodden down full of emptiness. They came into a shelter. They have the opportunity to take the medicine, the ordinances of Yahweh. Under the leadership of a ruler or governor or leader, spiritual leader. And then Yahweh comforts them and he forgives them. But there was a divide. On the other side, some of these people backslid again, turned back, did fornication and prostitution. So we see after the, the separation, there's a remnant that's now splitting off again, doing what is evil in the eyes of Yahweh. And there's a lot that repented and received forgiveness and came into his rest and shelter. So that is a bit of a hint what will happen after the Battle of Magog. So we read about the multitude that come from Gog, and that's basically refer, uh, referred to the sand of the sea. And that's one of the promises that was given to Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 7, where it says those will be like the sand of the sea, the nations that will come in. The others, he said, will be like the stars in heavens. They are the ones who came to faith prior to the tribulation and during the tribulation. The sand of the sea come to faith during this, uh, the wine press of the thousand years or as a result of Gog and Magog. So that's the two events of fulfilling the promise that was given to Abraham. And it's the promise that's actually driving all of this. Because Yahweh cannot lie. He promised this to Abraham. He will do it. And he will go to the extent and do it, redo it and do it over again until his promise is fulfilled. So it's actually the promise that fuels <coughs> judgment, that fuels refinement, and that fuels separation and extending grace to people. Because he's a God of his word and he does not lie. And that was established in Genesis 15 and also in Genesis 22. Promises given to Abraham. All right, so the multitude of Gog had the two groups, those who were inside the city and those who came out of during battle and they became part. The others who fornicated, to backslid again, the prostitution are referred to in Revelation 22 as dogs who are now outside the city. Listen to this. Revelation 22, 14, 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by its gates. But outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexual immoral, the murderers, the adulterers, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Mm. Now, they are outside the city after the smoke cleared. Mm. And that's a divide that will take place again in the eighth millennium and the separation. So yet again, the new cycle starts, and this is 100% in line with what's in Zechariah 14. And it actually support that um, and confirm that very strongly. And I've got a picture there of what I think the earth will look like. Babylon was destroyed. I'm going to get it happen. Everything was laid waste. It was a place of destruction and war, as you can see there. Then they had thousand years and they probably build it up again. And then the next destruction happened again. Mm -hmm. So the eighth millennium will start off similar to the seventh millennium mm -hmm. where they need to build things up again. And the ones who accepted Yeshua washed their robes mm -hmm. and accepted Yahweh's grace, they enter the city mm -hmm. and they enter the lower level, the initial uh, level of, of the city. And those who did not, they will, out, they will be outside 
and they now have to rebuild things up again. So we're going to read the scripture that supports that. I think it's the next slide, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, it's this one. So, yeah. So, Chuka, just let me clarify this, it might bring confusion. We looked at the Gematria of Chuka, which is the root word of Chukat, that's 130. If we look at the Gematria of Chukat, which is the name of the Torah portion, it's got the Gematria of 508. Now, the Gematria of 508 means dawn, perplex, confused, expulsion, disposition, earnestly looking for, to seek, forest, wood, cypress, pine, engraver, craftsman, metal craftsman, wheel up, clay pottery, earthen vessel, plowing, and then Serach, which is the daughter of Asher. Now there's a scripture in Isaiah too that basically support this, because in my mind, what I saw was eighth millennium starting, you missed the boat, all the people who accepted Yeshua, accepted Yahweh's grace, entered the lower end levels of the city, and those who are on the outside, they the dogs, they are now, they have nothing. So they go into the forest, they search, with, they need to find things to survive, they need to find things to rebuild themselves up again. Yeah. And what do they have? We're going to read what they have to work with, and that will confirm the commentary of 508. In the last days, the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall, and, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of Elohim of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. And that perfectly supports the meanings of the Gematria of 508, which is in line with what we read in Isaiah 2, which is the prophecy that link into the time after the war of Gog and Magog, people will go and stream up to the mountain to learn Torah. But Zechariah 14 tells us when they will go up during Sukkot, during the pilgrim festivals, they will go up to the mountain to hear the Torah, but also to bring their gifts. And if they don't do that, there will be no rain. Mm -hmm. So if you read those two in relation to one another, this color in another bit of the information. And it also highlights the, the devastation that they are living in and they are now need to build up again. Mm -hmm. Clean slate, start afresh from new in the eighth millennium. So when you listen to the Jehovah's Witnesses, they say, oh, oh they've got beautiful pictures as well. The lion and the lamb will lie together. It will be paradise. Everything will be beautiful. Mm -hmm. No, it will not. Mm -hmm. Yes, for those who are in the city, it will be beautiful. But those who are on the outside, it will be a next cycle. But that cycle is a cycle of grace again. Mm. sweeping together all the little pieces bring the fire melt it and start carving again mm. next cycle to deal with those who did not make it and now we will continue these cycles until every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is the lord mm. that's what i believe because that's his nature you will not give up mm. until every one is saved what do you think is because i mean People will have babies, so this will be continually going on. Yeah. It's not the end. No. And also in the Gematria, the 508 there, that <clears throat> is a picture of that time and the yeah. devastation. It looks like, you know, um, even going back to having to rediscover the wheel and, you know, clay pottery vessel plow. And, and it makes sense of that scripture you said, yeah. beating their weapons. weapons. That's what they have. Yeah. And they've got people with skills. So say, bring me the metal craftsman. Yes. Bring people to carve wood. Yeah. Let's build shelters. Let's bring the metal. We need to plow. We need to make food. Mm. Because it's not manna falling from heaven there. Mm. They need to look after themselves. And there's nothing. Mm. It's been destroyed. And they survived. Mm. 
So the eighth millennium looked just like the seventh millennium because both of them are after a war. And they start afresh. Now the eighth millennium or the seventh millennium, Satan was bound, he was released in the final war, Gog and Magog. And the eighth millennium, the prophet and Satan is cast into the lake of fire. So that deception will no longer happen. So what is left is what we looked at last week, is the Nahash can be created within man through Korach, rebellion and fleshiness. And that's what needs to be sorted out in this cycle. Because they will come out of the war, they backslid again, they fornicate again. It's all driven by the flesh. And that needs to be refined because their nature haven't changed. They haven't received elevated bodies. They haven't truly repented. They haven't received the spirit of Yahweh that elevated their, their nature to a new nature. They still have their fallen nature. And it's all to elevate the fallen nature to a new nature. So they have to go through the same process. So now the question is, will Yeshua have to die again for them? Do they need a savior in their time? Yeshua's sacrifice, he did once and for all, for all times, forever. His value of his currency, which is his blood, has got enough value to redeem every living soul up to the end of time and beyond. And he doesn't have to die again. He is currently the king teaching from the mountain, the city, his Torah, and he's handing out his medicine, his chukat, to the nations. And they need to consume that and, and receive the healing. And the healing is the Torah. So, just something. Is that, would that be, because now we're talking about the living, the born, the newborn, the newborn, the newborn. But those that have passed from life, that have lost their bodies, in other words, they died, does that include them as well? They were resurrected after the thousand years. They were resurrected and they formed part of the battle. Yeah, so like their like to, it's like a, re, yeah. a reincarnation, as people would say. Yeah, they were resurrected in a bodily form and they did too came against Jerusalem. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the second resurrection. So they, they resurrected and they judged. Or they got mm -hmm. saved because they, they repented. Saved. They might, some of them come out of mm. war, Gog, and they survived. Mm. So their punishment that they experience now, which is talk about torture and, and all of that, I think that's true, mm. but it's not forever. It's up to the point of the second resurrection. And they can choose whether they want to be deceived or whether they want to repent and follow Yahweh. So let's look at Serach. Serach is the same spelling as Sarah, but instead of the hay, there's a chet. So I, I just I didn't put the K in there, and it sounds like search. <laughs> you read it, so I put the K in there to make it Serach. What does Serach mean? I read about Serach in Numbers 26, verse 46. And she's the daughter of Asher. And Asher means happy, fat bread, and abundance. And this time it's a good thing. It's not to do with puffed upness and fleshiness. And the context of Numbers 26 is the census of the new generation. And this is what is found within Gematria 508. So what it tells me is that the 8th millennium, the people who come out of the remnant of Gog from that war, the survivors, they are now the, the new generation that's going to start a new cycle, still within their fallen nature. And they have to go through the same things that we are going through now. Because if they don't go up, there will be a curse in that. They will have no rain. So it's not everything is beautiful. And the only benefit they will have, there will be no war. Nation will not make war against another nation ever again. That's the only benefit they have. 
In the seventh millennium, the only benefit they had was Satan was bound. So Yahweh is actually extending grace, taking away a stumbling block. Now he's yet again taking away another stumbling block to help them to even overcome, to extend more grace to them so they can overcome. And that just proves the, the heart of the Father. And he calls them the new generation. And then, of course, the first word there was dawn. Dawn is the, the breaking of something new. And you can call it the dawn of a new generation, the beginning of something new and the new cycle that's starting. Within the context of the new heavens, new earth, a mighty mountain with a beautiful city and the tents surrounding it. Any comments and questions before we jump into the next? Or should we take a quick pause or should we carry on? All right. So jumping back on Chukat, so we basically finished with with that storyline. I don't know if we're going to pick it up next week. Don't know. It depends on what pops up. Just looking at Chukat and Chukah, the, the, the con concept of commandments that does not make sense. They are the more spiritual commandments because we can't figure them out. And specifically, the red heifer was one of those commandments that even King Solomon, and it's uh, captured in scripture. I don't know where it is, but... Um, he said that even he couldn't figure out what it's about mm -hmm. because he did not have the benefit that we have, that the work of Mashiach already happened. Mm -hmm. And now we can reflect back and now it, it will be revealed to us through his spirit. Samson didn't have that luxury or it wasn't for that time. Mm -hmm. I think that's more so. So these commandments or decrees are called paradoxes. Now, a paradox is something that contradicts itself. It's like having two buttons. When you press the green button, it says that you eject something. When you press the, 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 the red button, it says something is starting. Mm. It's the opposite that you expect mm. of the outcome of what you think it's all about. And I've got a picture there that presented visually of things that trick the mind. You can't really think about it. And paradoxes are basically spiritual things viewed from a physical perspective and we can't understand it because we don't have the reference points to make sense of them but once you're in a spiritual context when you look at these it will make perfect sense because you've got the foundation and the reference points that are spiritual and i believe the more you study the torah the more you learn the more these paradoxal concepts will start to make sense to you and you will uh, glean the, the the wisdom thereof now, chokat is related to the word chokmah, that means wisdom. And that's where there is wisdom hidden underneath the surface of the commandments you don't understand. Mm. And there's a lot of people, and I know people personally who say, oh, that's ridiculous. Mm. That's absurd. You know, mm. I won't stone my child. Why is that in the Bible? It doesn't make sense. Mm. Yes, it should be abolished. You know, just because they don't understand the commandment doesn't mean that there's not mm. some wisdom behind it. Mm. So rather than abolishing the commandments, we try to find the wisdom underneath the surface because those are the gems that will reveal the spiritual mm. to us. And that's why they exist. So it's a mindset that gives you the wisdom. And if you're foolish, fleshly, you won't even go there. Psalm 62, 11 says, one thing Elohim has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, Elohim. So that means that Yahweh says one thing, but there are multiple things associated with that if you dig a bit deeper. And we've seen that over and over and over and over again through the way we study the scriptures, specifically through going to the root word, going back to where it's first found, connecting the storylines, highlighting the wisdom. And then another deeper layer is looking at the Kamatra and getting more information about those things and how they supernaturally connect. Those are the paradoxes that we can't understand. Even on the surface, when you just look at the Hebrew language, for example, the word kadosh, that means holy, but it also means male temple prostitute. Yeah. One word means two things, and the two things are totally opposing one another. Yeah. One is holy, one is unholy but it's classified as the word holy. It actually means set apart. So a male temple prostitute is set apart to do a function within a temple 
So he doesn't have his own will and his own ways. He's purely focused on performing that one task. His whole life is set apart to do that thing. And that thing is bad. In relation to something that's holy, Yahweh's things are holy in his temple. And if people are holy, they are set apart to fulfill a function within his house that will support holiness. But now you have the contrast of the two. So the wisdom we will get if we focus and meditate on both. Male temple prostitute versus holy people. They're both in the house. The prostitute is connected to idolatry. Uh, adultery, sorry. Which is spiritual idolatry. So bringing in customs of the world, ways of worship into God's house is similar to have a male temple prostitute performing uh, physical acts that's not supposed to be in the temple. That's the way Yahweh sees that. So idol worship is bad, just from that meaning of that word in that context. And that's the wisdom we can glean, only looking at one word with two opposing meanings, thinking about it. That's amazing that we say that because when you look at the thing, the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil, you've got both, you've got one word meaning. Yeah. Yeah. That's paradoxal. paradoxal. In that one tree. You have a right and you have a left. Mm. You know, it's mm. amazing that that that's all in the world, actually in line, Yahweh gives you a choice. Yeah. And not only that, one of the rabbis I listened to, he said, sometimes it's good to study the, the evil thing to understand the good thing better. It's like looking at something with a shadow. If you study the shadow as well as the object, you get much more out of it because you only have this point of view, but the shadow actually gives you another angle to it. But it's only revealed through the shadow. And that's why we, we look at all these things in relation to one another to get that wisdom. What makes the word further paradoxical in itself is the Torah itself, because it only consists of consonants. Vowels are inserted by the reader. If you change the vowel point on a word, you change the meaning. So how do you translate the Bible now? It's personal. Yeah, it doesn't. You can't translate it. The Spirit translates it for you when you read it. So the King James Version that we read mm. is a group of people who translated the Bible from their point of view. Mm. There are multiple other points of views mm. built on the same foundation of mm. the consonants, mm. which is in the word. Mm. And the words in relation to one another. Mm. The words in relation to the passage. The passage mm. in relation to the context of where it's found mm. within the storyline. So and then you can say, oh, okay, then we can't trust this. No one can... Mm. Um, Translate the word accurately. What is truth now? Yeah. If there's multiple truths, how do I pinpoint the truth now? Because every person's opinion will, will weigh in and mean something. So what Yahweh did, he went back to make it so simple that even children can understand. He captured history and he led his people to walk in a certain way. And when you capture the storyline, it's full of imagery, which is very simple. And you can tell the story of Joseph, the story of Moses, the story of the Egypt, the Exodus, to a child and they will understand it. Mm -hmm. And when you take the storyline, it basically gives you the framework to frame your thoughts within and not to contradict the storyline. That's the key, not to contradict the scripture. Mm -hmm. That's why Bible stories are pinnacle, mm -hmm. very important mm -hmm. to support the truth mm. not doctrine mm. so going back to my upbringing in temple baptist church and getting the sunday school lessons and learning all the stories and then getting, most valuable foundation and then growing up and getting put in big church and, and seeing the contradictions and asking people hold on i learned this in sunday school but this doesn't add up and then the doctrines that's when they start telling you the doctrines mm. The doctrine stood out as cancer. Yeah, yeah. You can see it the mile, mile. <laughs> a child can see it. That's it, yeah. Yeah, I experienced, yeah. I experienced that first time. And if you go through the Torah cycle, guess what we are studying? The stories that you teach to a child. Yeah. yeah. That really came out to me today with the story of Balak and Balaam. 
it reads like a, like a children's story. It's a children's story mm. with some little gems in there, mm. very basic, mm. which are so powerful mm. that you can make applicable to your life mm. Mm. On, a, on a simple level. Mm. Now, if you look at the, 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 the acronym PARDES, those are the four levels of interpretation of scripture. Pashat is a simple way, that's a story it can tell to a child. And Remez is basically the Hebrew poetry. With this thought connects to that thought. When you think about both in relation to one another, something will jump up. And then you get thought, no, no, that's yeah, thought, which is basically something that's personal. And then you get no thought is the last one. Drash is where you uh, reason things out when you make it personal, and then so is the deeper hidden meanings within the Hebrew language and the Hebrew numbers. So we're basically exploring all four levels when <coughs> we study the Torah. But we always keep this, the top level, the storyline running so we can test these things against that. So we can formulate truth and avoid contradic contradictions. And that's where you need at least two witnesses to confirm something. Mm. I need to confirm a storyline as well, the overall storyline. Mm. That's why I like when I do the Torah portion, I want a storyline to flow mm. and to follow because if I get the confirmation in the next Torah portion that support my previous thoughts that I found, it gives weight to it. Mm. And then I can say, yes, that sounds right. It's mm. confirmed, reconfirmed, reconfirmed. And then gives you confidence that you're on the right track. Mm. So that's our only guidelines for truth. It's mm. the simplest way, which is on the surface. Mm. The story you tell to a child. Yeah. Yeah. Philip, do you really think about it? Why did, why did God send two witnesses at the end of time? Mm. To confirm the word. Mm. To confirm the story. People have said, we don't need the Torah. These guys are going to come and they're going to reach the Torah. Mm. They're going to yeah. confirm what has been preached. Mm. What is supposed to be preached, not mm -hmm. the traditional church teaching. Mm -hmm. That's the reason that Yahweh had such wisdom that he's sending these guys to come along and say, hey guys, you are a phase. Mm -hmm. And the two witnesses that appeared <coughs> with him on the mount mm -hmm. was Moses, Moses and Elijah, Elijah, the Torah and the prophets. Mm -hmm. Those are the books that will be read mm -hmm. in public the Torah and the prophets, mm -hmm. and people will be compared to that. They will hear it. Mm -hmm. yeah, they are, and both of those, you think, sure, so. mm -hmm. no, it's right. without even thinking about it, those two people connect with, you always associate Moses with the Torah, mm -hmm. and Elijah is a prophet that always comes to mind, yeah. mm -hmm. of all the prophets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even at Passover, he's there. Mm. Yeah, that's mm. right. Yeah. Philip, um, with the Chukat, the, the ordinances, wouldn't that be, you know, if you, you were saying, people say, oh, that doesn't make sense, I'm not going to do that, or I'm going to change it if, to make it mm. fit what I understand, that's idolatry. Yeah. Because if you're putting yourself you're putting yourself in the place of Yahweh mm. and saying my wisdom is mm. better than his. Yeah. Mm. That's it. And so this generation is I don't know, I know And don't you're the idol you worship the self. You mm. place yourself in the seat of authority mm. of your life and you worship that. And some people put that in the house of Yahweh in the seat of authority and they worship that person. Mm. Or that doctrine that came from that person. Mm. Even, even to say that one, you know, there's people that say that one version of the Bible is more correct than anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I mean, we need versions of the Bible. Well, how else are we going to read it without it translated into our language? But some people say, you know, like, the King James Version is the only version. If you read anything else, then you're. No, I grew, I grew up with that then, one as well. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Read, read the stories first. <laughs> yeah. mm. One can see why the emphasis was put on the teachers, mm -hmm. the responsibility yeah. of the teachers. Mm -hmm. That when they teach it, they've got to teach the truth. Mm -hmm. If they don't teach the truth, they're under condemnation. Mm -hmm. That is a, mm -hmm. a heavy thing, you know. And guess what is an, an ordinance? What is classified as an ordinance? Mm -hmm. It's a chukat. 
the festivals. Oh. They're ordinances. Mm. Yeah. And what do they abolish yeah. today? Mm. The ordinances. Mm. Shabbat. Sure, they don't make sense. Mm. Why do we do it? Yeah, the, re the yeah. reason why we shouldn't keep a particular day. Yeah. Mm. Why should we keep the seventh day? We can rest any day. Yeah. We can worship the reason any day. Reason out of it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So their freedom, their liberty is actually their mm. idol worship mm. that they bring into the house. Do what they will. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's why they need the ashes of the red air fire. <laughs> All right, the red heifer, let's jump into the paradoxical topic of this cow. So we're already touching on a lot of things um, in this. I've got the YouTube link there for the current update from uh, rabbis in Jerusalem who are from the Temple Institute. Mm. So we'll probably get something in there. We'll just keep tabs on it specifically before Passover. <coughs> it's good to check in and see where they're at because that will be the trigger, the first sign we will will get when is the three and a half year starting there's no red heifer don't worry about it wait for next year pass over so we we watch the signs within the seasons that's why the moedim or the festival are so important for end time interpretation and to filter out the rubbish and the false prophets so i'm trying to set dates or trying to tell us that we can be raptured out of here um, I've already said all of these things uh, in Numbers 19, verse 1 to 13. One thing that stood out for me is where it talks about Numbers uh, verse 13. Whosoever touches the dead body of a man that is dead and purifies not himself, defiles the tabernacle of Yahweh. And that soul shall be cut off from Israel because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him. He shall be unclean and his uncleanness is yet upon him. So that's the uncleanness we talked about, the cycles of cleansing that we're going through. So the one cycle of cleansing we're in is now, specifically up to the point after the first coming of Mashiach and the second coming of Mashiach, there's a cycle of cleansing. The first coming of Mashiach from creation to there, there was a cycle of cleansing. We're now in the second cycle of cleansing. Then we have tribulation, that's a cycle of cleansing. Then we have this thousand years, cycle of cleansing. You have Gog and Magog, another cycle of cleansing. And then the eighth cycle start, eighth millennium, another cycle of cleansing. It's because of the uncleanness mm -hmm. of people where the purification need to happen because you cannot break into the back door of the city. Mm -hmm. You have to enter in being purified. Otherwise, you'll be defiling the city, mm -hmm. the temple of Yahweh's presence. And the waters of purification is for your benefit so you can enter in. It's not to... Do anything other than that. You know, the word says, I am the door. Very the truth and the light. You don't come through the window, you don't yeah. come through the back, you mm. don't climb over the wall, you come through the yeah. door. The door. Yeah. You sure is the door. He's the way. Sure. He's the door. No matter what happens in life, no matter what you believe in, there's only one door into the city. It's actually 12. <laughs> Technically, okay. the means to enter the 12th is through the door, which is the purification. Exactly. Otherwise, you can't access the 12th. Mm -hmm. You will not be allowed. I think you'll be struck with lightning or something will happen. You'll we'll swallow we are. <coughs> you will not enter the city and defile it unless you are cleansed by the one with ultimately the main door of cleansing to give you access mm -hmm. to the city. What struck me with this verse is it's called the waters of separation. I thought it was the waters of purification. No, it's the waters of separation. Now, if you think about the term waters of separation, mm -hmm. what are you thinking about? Holiness. Not, not only that, where was there in our storyline within the Torah waters of separation? The Red Sea and the Jordan. That's it. There's two sets of waters of separation. What did he separate? Separate the enemy from uh, Yahweh's people. Uh, it was a battle. People uh, died. People uh, got saved. Jordan, the great tribulation, the great exodus, uh, same pattern. Waters of separation. Uh, the red heifer connects to both events, which is the storyline of leader being Egypt entering the promised land. There are two sets of waters of separation. But at the end of the study, we're going to look at two cows, two red heifers that's going to be sacrificed in one go that links to these two events of the waters of separation. Mm -hmm. 
which are required to enter in. So you need to go through two cleansing cycles, basically, to enter into the promised land, to enter into the city, or two doorways. And now the work of Mashiach during his first coming, work of Mashiach, his second coming. Two doorways you enter into. If you look at the tabernacle, enter the holy place, one door, into the holy of holies, second door. Two doors you have to enter into. And the initial one is his invitation to come in, to accept his offer. If you don't step into to that door, you're not going to even access his sacrifice. So waters of separation will basically protect the temple against you. That's what it's about. It's about Yahweh's protection against defilement. How do I protect myself against uncleanliness? I go and wash my hands. I use the waters of separation in my bathroom to wash my hands. So I won't get sick from the uncleanness of the things that I touch out there. Same principle. Right. Red heifer is para ad adama. Para means heifer. Comes from the word par. That means bull, calf, and ox. When you see the word ox immediately. Aleph. Picture, pictograph of Aleph is an ox. Ox represents your tevafai. Both add up to number 26. It means strength. It's the strength of Yahweh. So the strength of Yahweh is found in the foolishness according to Matt, which is Oh, you're, you're, you're the leader, you want to rescue the people, okay, we, the, the leader will die. And that's the solution. So from the worldly way, killing the Messiah mm -hmm. is foolishness in man's eyes. When you think of it, is that a strategy that Yahweh thought about? Doesn't make sense. But from Yahweh's point of view, it's his strength. <coughs> I'm offering up his own son because it's all about purification and cleansing. Mm. So that's where the ox relates to the red heifer, which is foolishness from man's point of view, strength from the ox's point of view, and his wisdom. Just, I, no, just, it's interesting because I thought there was two parshas today, so I read the next one. But um, Balaam, in that sort of poem thing that he writes, it looks like a poem, but twice he says, in two different sections, you can't curse God, the Yahweh's people because they have the strength of an ox. He yeah. says it again, they have the strength of an ox. Yeah. yeah. And the ox is the, the red heifer. Yeah, yes. And this red heifer is Mashiach. Yeah. That's the strength of an ox. Yeah. And the Mashiach is the Torah. That's the strength of the ox. Yeah. It's also the remedy that saves, saving salvation in the New Testament. It's also a term used for healing. Chukat mm. is the medicine prescribed by the healer to heal you from your stupidity, from your fallen nature. It's also there to teach you his ways to become like him. Mm. So first you need to get better, and then you need to get up and walk in his ways. There's two, two types of um, actions that you need to engage with. Yeah, I I just had a quick thought. You know, when the children of Israel got to the ocean, it was too close. The children of Israel, Moshe, lifted up to God, Yahweh opened the door. The children of Israel went through. The dudes behind, they put their door and shut on him. Mm -hmm. Nobody goes through Yahweh's door mm -hmm. unless he's king. Mm -hmm. Now the water will either cleanse you or drown you. <laughs> and you know it was the same with the Jordan. That when the priest went through, it had to be something that was holy went through. The water wouldn't open unless it was a tabernacle with the guys carrying that ark. When they be touched, the water opened. Mm -hmm. Don't think you're going to go in there. And it's simply symbolic today. You will not get in there unless you are clean. Yeah. Because the picture of the Jordan is the Jordan runs into the Dead Sea. It's a picture of Sheol. It will, the stream will pull you down if, if you're not walking through an open opening. All right. So Adama is the term also used for red to make red also adam which is man or edom and the term adam and red is linked to the original or the origin of creation of man 
after the fall of man in his fallen state. So the red heifer is the solution to Adam's fallen state. Mm -hmm. And that will be the remedy for the problem. So Yahweh's wisdom is already connecting the strength to the weakness, mm -hmm. the, connecting the ox or the aleph to Adam. Now Adam has the strength of Yahweh mm -hmm. to elevate him. Also the picture is man connected to the Aleph Yahweh, man who is Yahweh is Yeshua. Mm -hmm. That's another picture of um, the red heifer. <coughs> Water of separation is the word Nada. That means rejection by impurity of a menstruous woman, rejection of impurity of idolatry, to cast out, to drive away, freeing money or bounty or gift. So this is in relation to the temple. So you cannot enter the temple if you are connected to a life force that leaves the body. So if you bleed, if someone's died or you've got an emission of some sort, you cannot enter because life is in the blood, life outside of the body is death, death is uncleanness. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same way, idol worship is seen in the same way as uncleanness. Something that's not connected to life, it's something connected to death, and that's due to uh, judgment. And you need a bounty or a gift. The gift, of course, is a sacrifice of which the red heifer is the gift and the bounty to pay for that uh, impurity. Now, when we did the leprosy thing, we actually realized that we are born into ritual impure impure state because when you're born you come into this world covered with blood mm. impure just there mm. and then through all your bodily cycles on a year, uh, monthly basis or daily basis you're always in an unclean state mm. in the physical yeah, always even meeting people you know mm. yeah, you know <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we are clean. That's yeah. it. So you need to renewed body not to have this. Mm -hmm. That will allow you to enter. So it's only people with renewed bodies that will enter the city. Mm -hmm. That's why we will get renewed bodies mm -hmm. for that purpose. Mm -hmm. huh? <laughs> yeah, we might be bigger than now. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, Da's got the Gematria of 53, that means to cut off, slaughtering, place, grief, judgment, to buy, which is the word for redeem, circle, wall, which is a circle surrounding the city, refuge, and from the Father. So this all relates to the water of separation, which is a product of the ashes of the red heifer, that was sacrificed. Mm. If you just think about a normal sacrifice, you just cut the throat, pour the blood, sprinkle blood, done. So the ashes of the red heifer is one step further. You kill the animal, then you burn it, then you pick up the ashes, you mix water. Mm. It's, it's like a, a, a remedy. It's like making medicine, mm. so to speak. It's not a quick thing, sprinkle, sprinkle, little star, and it'll fine. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's more to it. It's, it's something that you need skill and it's only the Messiah who's got the skill, who is our healer, who is our redeemer, who is the one who can do that. And that's where the, the ritual of the red heifer is connected to the ritual of the cleansing of the leper, because we're in that fallen state of leprosy anyway. And the, the two connects in that, that so way. Do you see the red heifer as being an agent of mercy? Yeah. 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 Because, you know, it's, it's mercy yeah. that you are clean. If it wasn't, you'd be under judgment. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. When you really symbolically look at that heifer, it's a button of mercy. And if you look at being a female part of it, now male be trying to be a harsh. The dog's sick, give him an aspirin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the woman will take him and nurse him and, you know, what's the name? And that's why Yahweh works with us. He's merciful. Mm. Yeah. Sarah, uh, Nita, what's Nita? Oh, that's. Uh, um, Woman's time. Yes, I thought that's the same. Yeah, it's the same word. Yeah, water right. separation. Waters of separation. Mm. Mm. But in, in the um, in that little section there, you've got circle, wall, refuge. The water separation. I think that's what 
um, they used to, you know, castles used to use a moat. That's right. It's the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. Like a moat. It's a, it's mm -hmm. the same. And it's got a door that can lift up. Out, yes. And it protects. Protect, mm. protect the castle. So it's Yahweh's way to protect himself from mm. our uncleanness, mm. from defilement. Mm. And if you think about a circle, you think about the cycle. Mm. Seven day cycle is a cleansing cycle. It's waters of separation, it's waters of cleansing. Mm. Separation means set apart. Cycles of separation make you holy and cleansing yourself make you holy. Same symbolism. Mm. We get the seven festivals. We get mm. the seven mm. plagues and three cycles of seven in Revelation. Uh, that mm. is cycles of purification and cleansing as well. And they all relate to the red heifer. That's linked to the cleansing, purification, waters. Cleansing of the leper, access to the tents. This is in Leviticus 14, we talk about the cedar wood, the scarlet, the hyssop, the two birds kill in an earthen vessel over running water, and then you sprinkle it seven times and pronounce the person clean after that whole process. So we see the same symbolism within the red heifer. That's also found there. But not only that, the word bird <coughs> is the word tipor, tarik peiresh, which is tarik, that means righteous, or to cleanse oneself. And what's left is par, which is peiresh, that means young bull, beef of fault, to bear fruit and heifer. So we see the bird contains the heifer and righteousness. So the heifer provides righteousness, and that's a symbolism of the bird of cleansing the leper. Mm -hmm. So it's one and the same thing with the outcome revealed, which is tzaddik or righteousness. Mm -hmm. Same thing, water is the medium. You need to add something to create the medicine. You say the same functionality and, and symbolism there to connect the two even further. So the red heifer, I believe, is the cleansing of the leper solution, but more so in relating to the fallen state that was a physical thing. This is more the nature, cleansing the nature is the red heifer. Now the defilement or the cleansing of the land where the temple will sit, that's basically because man has been contaminating that as well as all the dead and all the dead trees, and all the dead graves, and all the dead that they have there need to be purified because Yahweh will not allow himself to be contaminated so these waters of purification will cleanse that as well all right so the symbolism of the people outside the city the dogs that symbolism of some if someone is leprous in the city they will send him outside the city and they will be outside mm -hmm. until they are declared clean mm -hmm. they need to be sprinkled which is symbolism of the red heifer, with symbolism of the work of Messiah, with symbolism mm -hmm. of the blood of Messiah, in order to come back into the city. Mm -hmm. So after every cycle, there will be lepers outside. And as they be cleansed, they will go in. And those who are not cleansed, they will stay outside and go through purification cycles. Mm -hmm. And then go enter in eventually after they receive their healing and their, uh, their cleansing. So this one relates to the symbolism of what we read about in Daniel 11, verse 45. It said, and he shall pitch the tabernacles of his palace between the seas, which is symbolism of the nations, in the beautiful holy mountain. So I've got a picture previously of the mountain with the 12 gates. And of course, the spiritual city sits on top there. And then I've got a picture of the tabernacle with the tents around. So just to give an idea of all the tents around the mountain. Mm. And this is during Sukkot, Zechariah 40. And we'll go up. Mm. And as they go up and they pitch their tents around, mm. that is the palace of the prince that he will then come draw near to them mm. in the form of tabernacles, which will have a violent separation. So they, he won't be defiled. They won't be consumed. 
but they can draw near to him during the Moedim, just like we have now. Beautiful picture of that language. Now, what we read in Zechariah 14, he says, and it will happen if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, uh, then there will be no rain for them. If the family of Egypt does not go up and enter in, they shall have no rain. This will be the plague with uh, which I will strike the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt and a punishment of all the nations who do not go up and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is basically a warning in the eighth millennium and what we note there, there's two groups mentioned there. I just wanted to say, why is there a specifically distinction between Egypt and the nation? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? So we see the family of Egypt, and they both get the same warning as if they are separate. And previously, we read about the splitting in half. There's a separation. And when I read the family of Egypt in my mind, I thought about the mafia, the family. You know? <laughs> they're sort of superior. They rule, they're the gangsters. And they're the ones who are causing trouble, mm. connecting it to the, to the Korah, the Korah mm. connection. Mm. And for the mere fact is because King Josiah's two sons, they were both connected to Egypt. The one only reigned for three months. And then he went to Egypt and he died there. His brother was appointed and he was subject to Pharaoh and took taxes from the people and let the money flow to Pharaoh mm. to get Egypt, you know, uh, looked after, mm. taking from the nations, which is basically our people outside the city. Mm. And the money now flowed to the family, mm. the so gangsters. Will be, mm, Egypt. Mm. Egypt. Bondage and yeah. So Egypt will be reestablished in the eighth millennium. Wow. <coughs> it also sounds like um, because Egypt has been through a cycle of those ten plagues in the, in the beginning, it's, a, it's almost like a pointing of the finger, like you remember. Yeah. In fact, maybe you've been through this, so you need to let the other nations know what it's like. You yes. know what I mean? Yeah. Like a, yeah. Um, it, it always struck me when I when when I read read this, how you think why is the church not has no focus on this at all, you know because it's it, on simple on simple reading, it seems evident that if God saw fit to reestablish the feast of tabernacles for the mm. entire world. In the millennium, why on earth would it not be important now? now. Exactly. exactly. Hmm. And he referred to the tents of Sukkot as his palace hmm. where the king will visit you. Hmm. Hmm. It's important to hold yeah. the Sukkot. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah? If you want to be visited by the, the king, hmm. if you have no Sukkot, you don't see him, you don't experience him in any way, shape, or form. But I think it's also because they don't realize that we have to undergo the cleansing, you know. Mm. Because to mm. the church today, it doesn't matter. You mm. can come just well. hop on his lap and yeah. just as you are, it doesn't matter. That's mm. the way. Mm. So I don't, that maybe that's the reason mm. why they don't, because they've got this. Picture. They blind it. They blind it, yeah. Mm. Mm. No, they can't see it. Yeah, and because they believe that they are righteous just because they accepted the blood of mm. Yeshua. Mm. No, so because they know his name. Oh, that's it. Mm. You, you just need to know his name mm. and call on his name. What's his name? Jesus. Actually, if I know the name, I'm saved. Mm. You don't have to I do what he did. Just, just know his more. name and call Somebody it. Cry out. If you know his name, it is like the internet of the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. And that's all you need. And which name are they talking about? Jesus. <laughs> when I listened to a pastor, mm -hmm. he was talking about Gematria. I was, oh, this will be interesting. Mm -hmm. Then he started off, you know, the Gematria, when people go and look at numbers, that's silly and foolish. You know what the Gematria is? 
Jesus. That's it. He's all the numbers. He's everything. So that's true, but... Yeah, but that's so zoomed out view, you can't even see nothing. What will you learn? Yeah, it's a very open-ended statement. Who's the creator of the world? Jesus. Who's salvation? Jesus. You know, it's every time the same answer for everything. You can't learn by having that zoomed out view of those broad answers. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Isn't it strange that, that you see, if the family of Egypt does not go, <coughs> they just come out of Egypt, mm. but Egypt was still in on him. Yes. It was in their flesh, in their leprous nature, so they stay. Yeah. And mm. Egypt is Mitzrayim, that means sin and bondage, which mm. relates to the flesh. Yeah. The it's the flesh that's start. got the ability to create a nachash within you. Yes. Right. Even though he's now bound in the lake of fire, you can regenerate that in yourself mm -hmm. through the fleshiness. And if you've got enough people supporting you, you will gain power as that and become one of the family. <laughs> it's strange that when they were in the wilderness, they were saying, if, we had, if you had not taken us from Egypt, mm -hmm. Where there was garlic and this mm. and that. Mm. It keeps going back to Egypt. I can say that in this. And this is all the same thing. Again, it's going back to Egypt. So yeah. Again, they just, they're wanting to go back to Egypt. Mm. Took us away from all of our fleshly indulgences. Mm -hmm. So they don't see Yahweh's house as their family. They see Egypt as their family. Mm -hmm. People like us. We're just sinners, you know. Mm. We don't try to be holy like those mm. who are locked over there. Yeah. Mm. Well, they're seeing, they're seeing the things of Egypt as their reward. So instead yeah. of seeing the things of Yahweh mm. as their reward, they're looking at the materialistic, yeah. and they, satisfaction as this is what we're doing everything for, is what yeah. we need. And their mm. prosperity teaching was this yeah. garlic, this, this, mm. and this, that. Yeah. Nice food, water, running water. Mm. Yeah. yeah. He's trying to take them through a process of purification. Mm. Yeah. And they're running always back to the... Mm. There's something fascinating that I saw. When I saw that picture, I just remembered that, yes, there's 12 gates of the city. There's tents around. And then I look at the Camacho of 12. And lo and behold, the word Gog is there and the word mountain is there. Wow. <laughs> Number 12. So outside the 12 gates, Gog, which are all the tents, gathered around the mountain. Interesting, isn't it? So within the scene, Basically, the 11 sons of Canaan is destroyed and not present in the city. But the 11th one, the last one, the Hamathites, they are in amongst the fallen state of man, which caused the leprosy. And that's King De Josiah, the one who healed the land and his offspring supported Egypt and supported the family. And the money and support all went back there and they accessed the nations. They brought division. Now, when you look at the family of Levi, who are the Kohathites, of which Korah was one, who caused the rebellion, if you make them part of the separation that caused the family, it seems like the family of Egypt was the priesthood of the nations. They had the appearance of men of renown spiritually, maybe at the Linga and all that, and they've asked their support took the money for fleshiness, but they also went up to the mountain. So they had the appearance of doing the festivals and all that, but their hearts was not there. It was for the flesh. And they actually exploited the people, mm -hmm. the nations who come from the, the Battle of Gog for their own fleshy desires. And they are the, the, the leaders. Because there's no more war, you just have this thing of the rebellious leaders who are in religion because they feed the flesh with the appearance of holiness because they do the festivals because they probably don't want the curse, but then they exploit the people who go there as well. Mm -hmm.
So the same pattern just repeats again. Feeding the flesh, bringing separation and causing people to, to go astray and feeding the flesh in Egypt. What's interesting too is, do you remember when they reached Egypt? Egypt was a symbol of wealth. Mm. They plundered Egypt of all they had their mm. gold and their silver and stuff like that. So when you look at the whole Egyptian system, it's what we've got today. We've got the top notches, we gathered all the wealth, we put people in bondage. Mm. Yeah. Happy. It's the same spirit behind it. Mm. So to confirm my my assumption that Korah was part of the family, mm -hmm. present in the form of rebellion, stirring up the flesh as a leader and becoming superior to the nations. I looked at the, the meaning for family that, that's Mish, Mishpacha. It's a Kamacho of 433. That means family and snow, which is ice, which is one of the meanings of Korah, which is ice as well. And that meaning is connected to the crystal, which is connected to the prophet. The Korah was a false prophet, family of false prophets, a bunch of scab heads again in the eighth millennium, deceiving people. Interesting connection there uh, that we see in the eighth millennium. So Yahweh once again will finish the cycle, complete the cycle, refine the people, and as they get sprinkled, they enter in. Those who don't, they stay outside. And then this dynamic keep on happening. And as people learn and follow, they will get, go in. Those who are on the outside will stay there, be subject to the family, and then will continue. Don't know what will happen after that, but that's a, the, the typical cycle that will continue. All right, so this is just a, a quick one, very basic, of the sacrifice of the red heifer. Where was that physically? Was it on the Mount of Olives? What was the place of the skull? Where was that located? Um, so basically, finding out from other people who've done a lot of research, there was a bridge built between the Mount of Olives, the foot of the Mount of Olives, and the east gate of the temple. And that's basically where they sacrifice the red heifer. And you can see in line right into the, the temple. And that's the place where Yeshua was crucified because when the veil torn, basically you had line of sight into the Holy of Holies from that point where you were sacrificed. Uh -huh. And that connected Yeshua and his sacrifice to the sacrifice of red heifer because they happened on the same location on the bottom of the foot of Mount of Olives. Just to orient myself, so, because we always get, we don't often get a, a perspective of Jerusalem from this, this way, it's always from the other way. And I'm, I'm assuming that the Dome of the Rock is actually at the right-hand side. It's a Western Wall. So which Wait. one's so? I'm so this to... East Gate? No, what gate is it? This is a triple gate or the East Gate. Yeah. So if East is this side, it's on the right. Then North is yes. top right. South right. is this. And West, West is the back of the temple. Yes. That's the Wailing Wall. Yes, and always and always you have the Wailing Wall and the Dome of the Rock up on the left, which puts it. But like where I said, so where the temple was, was the opposite end of the temple now, wasn't it? Yeah. So behind here, we actually saw that one of the shins, the valleys, that came up the middle one, mm -hmm. which was up to the, the western wall. Mm -hmm. And then the other shin was basically where that battle will happen, where the blood and the bones and the dead birds of the that bird will come and eat the flesh that will be on the other side. And this is basically where the Kidron Valley is. This front where the bridge is. That's the Kidron Valley where the threshold is, where the bride will be carried into the house to mm -hmm. fulfill that covenant. 
we've got the enemy there at the back, the dome of the rock, the, the um, guardian of the threshold. We want to stop this. Hebrews 9.11 confirms the, the connection to the Hefa and Mashiach. He says, but then Messiah came as high priest of the good things that are now already here. He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with hands. That is to say, is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, this obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are uh, outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished uh, to Yahweh, cleanse our conscience from acts that, that led to death? And then he said, when Moses had proclaimed every command of the Torah to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with the water, scarlet wool and branches of hyssop and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant, which Yahweh has commanded you to keep. So the blood of the covenant is connected to the uh, blood of the sacrifice together mm -hmm. with the, the cleansing waters and that's connecting mm -hmm. right back to Yeshua's sacrifice mm -hmm. and he is the one who is the red for sacrifice mm -hmm. redemption purification and sanctification mm -hmm. this is the two heifers and the two judgments where in first Samuel you read about a whole story where there's two cows or heifers, a wooden cart, the Ark of the Covenant, a large stone in the time of the harvest. In context of Baith Shemesh, that means house of the son and house of the servant. And this is the storyline where the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in the place called, the first one was Ashdod, that means I will spoil and powerful. They put it in the house of Dagon. That means fish. And it kept on falling over, symbolically bowing before Yahweh. And then they were struck with tumors, which are basically hemorrhoids and piles. Don't know why. Maybe they were male temple prostitutes. Oh. <laughs> Took away their, their way to service, so to speak. Yes. The ability. <laughs> Then they moved the ark because of their hemorrhoids to Gath, and the same happened there. Then they moved it to Ekron, and they were struck with piles there as well. It eventually travels through the whole of Philistine through seven months, and there were five cities affected, and there were five princes of mm -hmm. Philistine. Now, the five cities and five princes are basically linked to the names of the cities. So the cities are basically Ashdod. It means powerful. Um, that is made up of two words, ash or ash, that means fire and foundation, and David, that means beloved. Then Gaza, which is the Gaza strip, same words there, which is the Hebrew Azar, that means strong, great, and goat. Ashkelon, that means a fire of being weighed or the fire of judgment. Then Gath, that means wine press. Ikron, that means emigration, torn up by the roots. And this basically gives us the context of what is happening from the time that we are now. We're in the time of the fish heads, the prophets of Dagon. Who are they? Our mates, the Catholics, with their fish head mm -hmm. coverings, head coverings, whatever we call them. Yeah. Yeah. Party hats. They had party hats. And they are in the presence of the beloved, the body of Messiah, which is depicted by Beth Shemes, which is the house of the servant and the house of the son. So Dagon is actively working in the house of the son, which is the body of Mashiach. And he's performing his rituals, which are uh, all these idol worship, 
and whatever they do and the whole of the body has been influenced by them and i saw a video that Walt, walter weiss showed in i don't know when he made his dvd series the great onslaught he showed how almost every denomination christian denomination went to go and kiss the hand of the pope and huh? bow before him mm -hmm. everyone did it mm -hmm. even the jews mm -hmm. yes in the name of peace. Yeah. I think it was only the Seventh day Adventists who did not do it. Yeah. All the other denominations, the Lutherans, the whatever, yeah. they went down and did it. Everyone did. Yeah. And they are the daughters of the Whore of Babylon because yeah. of that act yeah. that they did that I saw with my own eyes. Yeah. And that's why they bow before Dagon, the Fishet, yeah. the Philistines. That's doing idol worship in the house of the sun currently. So that's the state that we're in. There's still a close connection now between the Catholics and the and the Palestinians. Yeah. It's, you know. yeah. Because they're their prophets. Because it's, it's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're prophets of the Philistines. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the house of Dagon. Mm -hmm. And what happened next is what we read is that the plagues will come upon the Philistines. The other village dwellers, which it's in Revelation called the village of Babylon, which is a system of mixing and confusion. Mm -hmm. And the fire of being weighed will come and destroy the Babylonian system. So now we're moving into the theme of the Great Tribulation that will destroy that system. Mm -hmm. And after that, we will get the wine press, which is the meaning of Gath. And after that, they will become wanderers that will be unrooted from their villages. So they will be in a desolate place in the seventh millennium called the wine press, which we've read about previously. And that will last for a thousand years. That's connected to the seven months the ark traveled through Palestine, mm. the seventh millennium. Mm. It will happen in the same way during the wine press. Mm. And after the ark uh, was mm. sent back to Israel, that is when the city will come down mm -hmm. from Jerusalem and the presence of Yahweh will come down. And what we read between the lines here is the Ark of the Covenant caused the judgment. The holiness of Yahweh caused the judgment and it's to protect and secure the promise mm -hmm. and to make the promise come to fruition because Yahweh cannot lie. So it's actually because of the promise and his presence that there's judgment. So if you want to be very close to Yahweh, make sure you're in the great tribulation because he will be very close. Mm. Because we see that in the meaning of Ashdod. Of not Ashdod? Yeah, Ashdod. It's the word Ash David, which is the fire of Yahweh, the foundation of who he is, who is the beloved, who is Mashiach, who will be the judge. Mm. He will be there in his presence. And because he will appear coming from a place of light, interacting with a place of darkness, the two cannot exist, you get a, a reaction. Mm. Because the spiritual will meet the physical, mm. the light will meet the darkness, and it will destroy the darkness. Mm. And that's what judgment is. Mm. Judgment is not Yahweh being angry, trying to do it. Judgment is just the king mm. appearing in his holiness. And his holy fire will consume darkness. Mm. That's it. Mm. So he is dangerous. We see that there was a big rock. The rock was the place, or the big stone was the place of where they prepare uh, the, the grain for the harvest. Where they remove the chaff from the seed. Mm. The seed they put in the storehouse. That's the people entering into the city. And the chaff, they're on the outside. Mm. And then they will be brushed together the fire will melt them and Yahweh will start carving again through the cycle, the next cycle happening. So all the symbolism there. And what we see there is that the it's in the time of the wheat harvest. Now this is interesting because the end times relates to the fruit harvest because it's the fruit or the new life that will come as a result of judgment, mm -hmm. which is the fruit of you know, new, new life, birth, and uh, people getting reborn. 
But if we go back to the fee cycles, the pinnacle is always Shavuot. The end goal is Shavuot. We read previously in Isaiah that he will be on the mountain teaching the Torah. It's all about Shavuot, the Torah that will come down, the Torah that will be taught. The time of the harvest is to bring the seed and the chaff in relation to the Torah. The Torah will allow you in or the Torah will separate you, the waters of separation, and then cleanse you outside the city mm -hmm. through the waters of separation and purification. So the Torah is your medicine, but it's intermingled with the promise that bring the presence, that bring judgment, that bring purification, and that whole cycle will continue naturally because that's the way how we did it. And it's fueled by his grace. So this cycle won't stop until his grace runs out, which I think will only run out after every soul has been uh, purified. The last one is just about the timing. We already discussed this. The red heifer and the appearance of the red heifer will need to happen before the two witnesses, which is about starting with sacrifices, stopping sacrifices, abomination, desolation, set up. So we need to look for that red heifer first mm. as our first sign. And then we look for the two witnesses after that. Quite interestingly, there were nine red heifers. The first one was Moses. And the first that says, I don't have the reference, but it says, have them bring you a red heifer. So they had the red heifer. Moses asked for it. So in his time, there was a red heifer. And then in the time of prophet Ezra, during the first temple, there was uh, another red heifer. And then after that, there were five people with seven red heifers. And I've got their names there. The first one is Simon the Just and Yohanan. Each had two red heifers in their time. Then Elu, Eluni, Ben Hakov, uh, Chanel Ha Mitzri, and Ishmael Ben Pavi, a PVA. How do you say that? Each had one heifer and a total of seven heifers up to the time of the second temple. So in the last 2000 years, there was no red heifer. So we're waiting for the 10th red heifer to appear. Wow. And number 10 has to do with completion and fulfillment. And the last red heifer will, will signal in the coming of Mashiach. So that's how we filter out false prophets making rogue statements. Where's your red heifer? Where's the sacrifices? Mm. Until then, we wait for the next Passover and see what's coming. And, and for now, we live our lives as if the Messiah is a thousand years away, but we prepare as if he's coming tomorrow. Otherwise, everything will stop and you will lose relevance. Mm. But we need to be prepared internally mm. as if he's coming mm. tomorrow. And the, the cycles of the festivals help you to do that. Don't yeah, you? that's and the time we look we keep looking forward to for that. what's coming. Mm. So that's why I'm, I'm preparing this um, these cycles just to try and put things mm. together give us more hints about mm. what we can expect and what's coming. See, I'm starting to really sort of see it now. The, the process of purification yeah. as you go through the cycle, every year you see something new. A greater, because, you, because you're being transformed, yeah. more becomes evident and, uh, and so you're being elevated. Yeah. Who knows where we end up yeah, we learn more That's about it. the chukak, the, the mm. paradoxes, and understand it and no longer mm. confuse us. Mm. It builds your foundation stronger of yes. your faith. That's what we're doing. And we're preparing to help others to come in mm. as well mm. because we cling on to the simple storyline of his salvation and stories of Moses, Abraham, Joseph, all of that gives us a perfect pattern of salvation. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I so, I'm link thinking of um, um, yeah. Esau is red and hairy. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. There's probably no connection, but <coughs> you know, yeah. they make a point of telling you that he's red and hairy. And that, that you think of the red heifer being red and hairy. 
Yeah. And he's a man of the field, so he needs mm -hmm. the red heifer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, it was well, Edom was in the. Mm -hmm. uh, Edom. Oh, it was in the pasture today. Yeah, yeah. and Edom is the offspring of stopping, red. Mm -hmm. Stopping them from passing through That's to right. get to the oh, yeah. territory. Yeah. Which is the. Which is, um, the flesh is in the east, all of yeah, and opposing is the word hasatan. Yeah. If they oppose us, they work mm. alongside yes. the opposer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that's all, folks. Any comments or questions? Or yeah. the enemy is trying to stop the cycle, but you know, Yahweh in control all the time, he keeps mm. the cycle going. Mm. So the people will learn the lesson. They will go through the judgments, they will go through the persecution, mm -hmm. they will go through the trials and tribulations till they purify themselves mm -hmm. and come through it. And what, yeah. sorry, uh, for, uh, you know, I just I wonder why don't, the, why don't the Israelis just take the Temple Mount and, and challenge the whole thing? It's because they can't. It's not, it's, God, not it's not within God's yeah. timing. And yeah. only He will. Allow a red heifer, yeah. and that will give them the go ahead. Yeah. Okay, now we can do it. Yeah. They can't just do it because they still uh, uh, adhere to yeah. Yahweh's commandment, yeah. which is the chukat, which is this paradoxical yeah. thing you can't explain that they just obey because Yahweh said so. Yeah. It's like everything has to be done. Like the transporting of the ark could only be done yeah. in the right way. Yeah. You know, yeah. everything has to be done according to God's. Perfect time. Mm. Yeah. And it's interesting that the, the ones that are unclean say, ah, oh, take it away. We don't want it to you know, take mm. it somewhere else. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Something interesting that I just saw um, when the five princes, the lords, five lords of the Philistines, they made golden objects to represent the plagues. Five golden objects of piles. So imagine what that looked like. I know. <laughs> no, yeah. And then five golden objects of mice. Mm. So they had the plague of mice mm. and the plague of piles mm. at the same time. Mm. So when we see there's a plague of mice, mm. it's sort of giving us a hint, doesn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 Prophecy of you said about people hiding behind trees, eating the mice. Yeah. yeah. Eating what? Eating the, the unclean the thing and the mouse. And the detestable thing. So yeah. eating something else, the detestable thing, and, and mice. And mice. Yeah. Mm. Standing behind a tree. Mm. Where's that scripture? You can find it. Mm. Mouse. Uh, well, no, no, it's not, but maybe that's what they Eating a mouse. And they, it's in Isaiah 66, 17, and they shall sanctify, them, sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh, and the abomination and the mouse so three things. Swine flesh, shall be consumed together. And mouse. I wonder what that abomination mm. is. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the abomination that causes desolation. They sanctify themselves. Yes. Maybe it's mm. human. Could be. If it's not mentioned as an animal, maybe yeah. it's human flesh. Yeah, they might have it here. The abomination. Are you looking for that word? Could it be human flesh? It's just a abominable, detestable thing or idle, unclean thing. 
to eat of something is to take part of it or to consume it. Let me see where it comes from. Majesty means detestable. Shin Kuf Tariq. To loan a loot. And have parties simulating it. Mm. Oh. So this basically means a gift, um, house of bread, food, queen, portion, gifts. So even in, in the house of worship, that's where they live. Divine, to so just in behind one tree. What, you know, yeah. You know, and why does it say they purify themselves and then do that? Or well, that no, that's how they try. I think that's how they purify. Them. Trying to purify themselves. What it's a, think? I think it's part of their holiness to make themselves holy, or mm. what they deem as set apartness. The way mm. they mm. Mm. They're set apartness. Well, it's a bit like what you said. They. They use detestable things to try and, you know, they made the mice out of gold. And, uh, yeah. And, and they did that yeah. as a burnt offering unto Yahweh, so yeah. offering a gift unto Yahweh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My, yeah, my plate now was in the form of a golden object. Mm -hmm. Give back to the one who gave me the plate mm -hmm. as a gift. Mm -hmm. So there must be a connection. If you just go through the platform, you remember that little city that you had in the top corner with that oxen on and out? There was a city that you showed there early on. Yeah, that island city. Oh, yeah, yeah, that one. The one that looks like a penguin. You see that? Mm -hmm. I saw that island this morning on Facebook, which they have just found now in the North Sea underwater. They're just exploring it. The reason they found that is that when they dive down there, they can't even get signal. The signal gets distorted. The compass goes round and round and round, swirls around. Mm -hmm. That city was underwater in the North Sea. Mm -hmm. so they so just good. discovered that now. What is it? What city is it? They don't know. It's unexplained. It was unexplained thing happened in that city there when they go when they're trying to. Communication, the communication just go away. Yeah, so it's a similar city like this. And the other thing we saw in that documentary, there's another city that's in the middle of the sea that's part of that ring that connects through the golden ratio, where all the giants, all these magnificent yeah, structures are found. Yeah. yeah, no, that one is not underwater. Oh, there is parts of it that's yeah, underwater. Yeah. So they got big statues and stuff. Mm -hmm. But so they also have these big stones that you can't explain how they build it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they use the, the, the meter as their measuring. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not. That's on that band, band of documentary that I've seen. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Very that. interesting. Yeah. Was that on Netflix? No, that no. was on Prime. Prime. Yeah. yeah, we saw that. Yeah, they, they, um... So they use a modern way to measure. Yeah. And it fits the golden <clears throat> ratio as well. So it's it's like it's advanced <clears throat> technology that was yeah. ancient. And who built that? Who built it? They don't know. The sons of Anak. Oh. Because um, the, te the meter, the. Um, so I've got this little book of poems somebody gave me with maths. I'm going to go back and read it now that we've been into maths. And she says that the author, um, that the 
the imperial measurement for 12 is you know like inches and all that that was based on the, the um, scriptural um, yeah the biblical maths. yeah the 10 is not that's a yeah. you know another dimension yeah. so that's interesting yeah we switched yeah. from 12 to 10. It's easy to add up, but it mm. is. That's cool. Mm. If you were taught the right way, it would be mm. easy too. Yeah. And she said it's quite modern too that they introduced the concept of zero, but there's that didn't exist yeah. in mathematics. Yeah. Mm. Today you start to count zero, one, yeah. two, three. Mm. Mm. And there's, there's never nothing. It's like, yeah. well, that fits with Yahweh. Mm. It's not nothing, there was yeah. something mm -hmm. there, and there's mm -hmm. the word. He yeah. keeps recreating out of what mm -hmm. is already there. Whereas evolution mm -hmm. says in the beginning there's nothing, and then the bang of it. And Yahweh says in the beginning there's the word. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. so it's all there in the maths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, um, the beast that comes up out of the sea, could that be connection to these ancient. Um, Things on the ocean that were an ark and whatever else built. Them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most probably because mm -hmm. I mean, they even found, well, when they say, I think I showed some of the pictures last night and they talk about Stargate, and uh, yeah, Stargate's like four poles, mm -hmm. or they reckon it must have been something like that. So who knows? Mm -hmm. Who well, knows? There's the whole thing of UFOs are not just seen. Flying above you, also going into the ocean. There's yeah. a reason for it. Mm. 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 Very interesting. Mm. All right. So, who wants to close in prayer? Father, mm. mm. uh, um, uh, I just feel so strengthened by this deeper knowledge of your word in ways that I can't fully express, but thank you, Father, for this ability to see things that people from many, many years didn't have the ability to. And um, we know that this is one of the signs that we're coming to the end of this current cycle of the world. And we know that we're coming into a time of great uncertainty and then eventually tribulation. And Father, we want to have the foundations laid within each one of us and our families and our extended families that prepares us for what is to come. Um, and But not only that, prepares us to be able to share with those who have no understanding, give a clear picture and some level of support um, for them when they encounter things that are just beyond the comprehension. Father, we just thank you for giving us this time and this ability to see the deeper things in your word. And uh, Lord, uh, we just ask you to continue to purify us as we continue this journey with you. We thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.